So we're really excited to be in, I'm so excited to be in conversation with you, Michi, but as a museum educator, I'm actually gonna start with you, the audience. So what I'd like for you to do is, I'm just gonna go around, I'd like you to give me one adjective to describe what you see, feel, or think in this space. Just one, I'm holding you to one, maybe a phrase, no more than three words. Anybody have any questions about the instructions? So I'm gonna start here. One word. <laughs> One word, somebody else. Listen, I'm gonna tell you like I tell my audiences at the museum, I can't grade you. I can't give you a promotion or demotion. There is no judgment in this space. Just one word, and it could be anything, anything. Truly the title, mm -hmm. I know, you know I can't say that. That's okay. <laughs> the title is indicative of the work. Ah, so the title, it really lets you feel what the work is about. Thank you. Listening. Listening, thank you. Contrast. Contrast. Dusk. Dusk. Life. Life. Enclosed. I can't see everyone, so I'm going to trust you to go down the line. <laughs> I'm sorry, ominous? Ominous. Ethereal. Ethereal. Relations to the firmament. Oh, relations to the firmament. Journey. Journey. Uh, navigation. Navigation. Moonlight. Moonlight. Sorry. Thank you. Dreamlike. Dreamlike. Divine. Divine. Say again? Alluring. Alluring. I think we're in the back row. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Space. Space. Lost. Lost. Drib. Drib. Attending. Attending. Illuminating. Illuminating. Cosmic. Cosmic. Black. Black. All the way against the wall. I'm looking at you, Chanel. <laughs> introspection warm, warm. Um, constellations. say it one more time constellations, constellations. majestic, majestic. Yeah. thank you temporal, temporal. philandus outside. outside so the reason for that exercise is a I wonder if those words can sort of anchor you, right, to your understanding of these works, but I also wanted us to get a sense of, while we're all looking at and sitting in the same space, how different, even if connected, our descriptions were. Some folks focused on the mood it might set. Some folks focused on the content, starry constellations. Some folks focused on the feeling it might provoke, from ominous to alluring. So. All of these things exist in this space, which exist within these works. So rather than starting with us sort of trying to explain them away, I want us to sit with your impressions of the work, which are just as important as you build a relationship with the work in the ways that we would like you to through our conversation today. Have you ever done anything like that around your work before, no, Michi? What did it feel like? No. I'm I'm like, I feel like that, that the majority of the wording was true. Like all of it was true. These are all things that I've thought about as I've made the work, you know? So I, I think that that was really good. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> and so what I was hoping we might do is actually start with a story. So if you could tell us what provoked this body of work. I know it was this sort of movement outside. We've talked a little bit about um, maybe what was the impetus for sort of getting outside. That's always a hard one. And like, even when you asked me that upstairs, I, yeah. I, I like struggled with it. But I, I, think, I, I think for me, like the start of this work sort, sort of began as, um, as an elementary school child where I, in, 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 at my school, they had these um, weekly readers. And in this little paper, they had like little stories, current events and histories. And like one time they had on the history, and maybe it was black history time. And there, there was this image of Matthew Henson and he was the explorer and he found the North Pole and all this stuff. 
But for some reason, I've held on to that image in my brain. And I guess in my adult life, I've tried to become my, be my best version of Matthew Henson. So I guess like this sort of journey starts from that little photograph. And then once the pandemic sort of happened, there was this opportunity to sort of just run away. And in that running, I think that I begin to see myself more as Matthew Henson to, to where I was this explorer. And I was trying to go into these spaces and approach them as brand new or as I was the first man on this piece of land. And so with 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 all of that like but right around 2017 I, I sort of had an opportunity to go out and um do a residency in the desert where i i camped out at uh at the base of mount whitney and sort of like in the distance there was death valley so it was like a sort of interesting position to be in sort of like at the highest peak in america and sort of the lowest point at the same time but then to be at the elevation that I was, to be able to see both of those things. And then just off in the distance, in this place, um, Lone Pine, there's a place called the Alabama Hills. And so in the Alabama Hills became known as that because it was like some Confederate holdout. And so in my brain, it triggered something like I've run all the way to the, to the West Coast. I've gone far out into the desert. I'm trapped here for two weeks. And I still have to look at some Confederate bullshit. Like in my peripheral, in my down view. It's a beautiful space. But if you've ever watched a Western with your grandparents or parents, like wherever they film those cowboy movies, those were done in the Alabama Hills. And like that landscape is absolutely beautiful. But to know the history of why it became the, the Alabama Hills was something that, that began to bother me. And so, I began to try and embody this, this little photograph of this man, but then also deal with my now, which was to go and chase this transcendent moment where I could then begin to personify nature and have these great quotes like, like a John Muir or a, or any of the great nature writers that we think about. And so I wanted to sort of have this moment of transcendence to, to where like the voice was mine, where maybe one day something I wrote would be on a meme, you know what I mean? And you could have all the toxic positivity that you want, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so when you're having a bad day, it's like, oh, Michi Miko, like, whatever, you know, something, <laughs> something flowery, you know, to, to power you through your day. And so it, it, it just sort of came from that. Yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah. very yeah. simple, yeah. like a child looking at a photo of a man who I thought was just absolutely beautiful and badass. Mm -hmm. And then to be an adult and then put into the situation that I can't escape that I thought I was going to be able to escape. But as usual, your simple has all of this entangling subtext. <laughs> so you're talking to, to my mind about being a pioneering runaway. Yeah. It reframes this idea of a running away from to a running toward, toward exploration. So exploration feels different to me. So running, which is the way you've described it, and running away feel like slightly different to me. Yeah. Um, and so, but they seem to get collapsed a little bit in that, in that formulation. You know, I can't let it go. So, <laughs> so, so, I, like. so, I know. <laughs> so, but I, I want to think about particularly, but that tension between the pioneering and the running away, I find in some of the ways that there's a tension in the Though it's not jarring in the in the juxtaposition of perspectives or or even in plane or in planes in some of the paintings, I'm looking particularly um, at this work to our right, in which sort of across the bottom you have the feeling of a lakescape or a but it's very sort of 
planar as though we're looking across, but then you, it intersects with this sort of intergalactic map. And you all did this gorgeous job of creating this visual poem of what's happening in here because you spoke to things that were terrestrial and to things that were cosmic. Right? You spoke to maybe a sense of ominousness, but also to this alluring kind of elegance right? that all interact in this same space. And so I was wondering, um, could you speak a little bit to the ways that you are uh, composing? Yeah, so the best way that, that I can explain some of these works is, is, is um, even, even though I go out and I do the sketches, and I take the photographs, I don't refer back to those because I think that the paintings themselves sort of exist in a moment of improv, which I think then goes back to a history of, of blackness, which goes back to jazz. But then from my generation, it goes back to hip hop, which goes back to a, to a freestyle. And so f for me to make these works, what really ends up happening is that they're, they're bits and pieces of landscapes from different areas that I've been. It's no specific place. So these sort of places sort of, they sort of blend together, they collapse. They're memories or thoughts or distances, like, and I'm trying to bring them forward. And then, so in that confusion, there, there be, there's a moment where I can sort of make the landscape new that that becomes mine, right? So like this image in the back, it's absolutely like the ground from the desert. But then the idea of having cuckabugs, mm -hmm. that's absolutely like a Southern thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so out in the desert, these things, like these things sort of don't exist, but, but the harshness of that and then the stickiness of that, they sort of begin to sort of make sense. But, but to approach this work, you have to realize that that works in on a distance. Mm -hmm. And because I'm, I'm really into creating um, um, sort of like depth with flat paint, like everything is flat. I'm, I'm not mixing colors. I don't have time for that, right? Because I'm in the improv. Yeah. So everything is flat, but then in that flatness, there's a moment on the picture plane where things are flat. Mm -hmm. So in that depth, there is a flatness. Mm -hmm. And then within that flatness, there's a closeness. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these things with perspective and, and sort of ideas that I want to elaborate more on. Yeah. No, you, no, you guys will have to listen to the podcast because she, yes. she absolutely <laughs> cracked that code. But, but there are a lot of different things happening visually to get you into this work. And it's, and, it's, and it's almost about there being this confusion or this compression of idea and thought. And then someone said luminous, lo looming, or was it you? Ominous. Ominous. That thing. Mm -hmm. That thing. Mm. There's a beauty there, but then there's something there that's just not right that word <laughs> a bit like black holes which i always think of when i'm looking at your work because i think of black holes as places where physics goes to act up act up yeah. right or the, but these spaces are where um uh the strangeness of the universe exists in a visual form so to me this becomes to my mind i'm gonna get a little nerdy like heisenberg's principle the ways in which the more you know about the location of a quanta, the less you know about its speed. The more you know about its speed, the less you know about its location. That kind of internal paradox of knowing and, of knowing and unknowability that happens simultaneously seems to fit into this. There's a, there's a way in which it provokes you to say, oh, I know this space, but also there's something that falls completely outside of what I might know or experience because it is so deeply connected to that relation that you develop yeah. in, that, in that space and time that I know there's always something that slips outside of. There was a moment in the desert where I stepped outside of my tent at 3 a.m. in the morning and 
the Milky Way was right over my tent. And in that moment, your importance or my importance shrank. And then I began to realize how tiny and small I was in the vastness of it all. And that does something to your ego, right? It's, it's like, what the fuck? It's like you said, <laughs> it's like you said, you know, nature doesn't give a shit. It's indifferent. It doesn't, so, it doesn't give a shit. Plus, so. Also, jokingly, in that moment, I was like, wow, the Milky Way must be where black people come from because it's the only cluster of stars up there blinging for no reason. <laughs> All the other stars are just by themselves. But these are obviously a different group and they're just like fucking extra. Right. Doing the most at all yeah, times. Yeah, doing the, yeah. <laughs> there, that may be a note in the book. It, mm. it may be in there, but, but from that sort of funny thought, it, it, it then began to trigger these, these other things that I, I, I sort of began to chase in the work, mm. technically and within the work. Mm -hmm. So I won't tell you all of them. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving me that look. I'm, no, no, <laughs> no. But um, I, I won't tell you all of them. <laughs> I did notice in the book that you often personify nature as she. And I was thinking about, because I keep thinking about this nature being indifferent. And to my mind, and we talked about it here, so please listen to the podcast, nature has an agency outside of the realm of human, of human agency. It's not about subjectivity. It's not that we're saying that rocks have volition, but there is a way in which things in nature occur outside of our desires, our ends, um, and, and stand alone. And it seems like that's an encounter, that personification is sort of staging that encounter with yeah. almost. I, I, guess, I guess that goes back to our thinking of, of nature being like this nurturing thing, which it, which it can be, it can be. But, is this, but it is this thing that gives zero fucks. And it is indifferent and it will take you. It does not care. Like this one, like the ants can have my body. That's like me having a panic attack and I know that nature will win in the end. Just me being at peace with it. The ants gonna start first. So. It's just that simple. Like, so with this thing, we say mother nature, mother nature. So mother also has a wrath. Yes. And that wrath is, is, is very true. And it's like once, like when I had the, the sort of drowning incident, all I could think about the river was, is that she will take you. And that she then turned into Mami Wata, which is a she. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that that's how that sort of got mm. into that, me talking about the wind or the breeze or yeah. different things. Yeah, throwing feathers. <laughs> yeah. But then she could yeah. just be a nice person. She's material. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there, because there were also these really just subtle hints, beautiful hints throughout your writing, things like I had to disconnect to reconnect. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on that notion. Where do we find that kind of reconnection or the disconnect or the interplay of both? Well, for, for me, it, it um, I guess it sort of starts here mm -hmm. with, with this thing. Mm. And, and by engaging with this thing, there, there was a moment to where I began to feel like my life didn't match up to other people's lives on this thing. And so this thing began to give me all of these anxieties or, or, or these like, I am not worthy, like this, these feelings of like, like I'm not enough or I'm not adequate or what am I doing with my life? My life sucks. And so that's very true. I think about when, when we think about the, the, um, 
the curation of, of, of people's timelines, right? And like we talk about upstairs, like we don't see the bullshit that it takes to get to the beautiful, right? Because it, it's absolutely ugly, right? And so I begin to have an issue with social media. And I also, there's, um, there's an interview with Jack Whitten where he talks about, we don't know the long-term effects of, of social media, right? And so I begin to recognize in my own brain that something was off. Like, this is not right. I, I don't feel like this normally. Like, something is wrong, something is wrong. And I kept telling myself something is wrong. And then I began to, to realize too that I was having more anxiety and more panic attacks and more like this, this is like I've never had this kind of stuff. And so I made a decision to just like get off of my social media. So if you go to my Facebook, probably the last post was 2018. If you go to my Instagram, the last post, there's a, there's a piece of, um, what is the wood that they burn? Uh, Palacento. There's a there's a photo of Palacento burning and it says to repel ghosts. It was the last time I posted on, on Instagram besides um I posted last week about the book. Because my idea was I wanna get off of this thing. I wanna become invisible. I wanna have these moments for myself, to myself, and I don't give a damn if anyone knows that I'm having them or not, because they're for me. I want something for me. And so my rebellion became against the, the, this, the algorithm, I guess, in some sense. And then it was a way for me to deny you guys um, entry into my life, right? Because by this time I'm in therapy and I can't figure out what the fuck's wrong with me, right? I know nothing's wrong with me, but something's wrong with me. And it, be, it all became like, for me, like the social media and things that I was dealing with, trying to arrive at this moment, which is becoming an artist and doing all these things, right? And so by me disconnecting there and then reconnecting here, there, there began to be a different change with, within my brain. Like there's something more important out there than what's in here. And even the photos here doesn't do that justice because you don't get to get the mosquito bites or smell the fire. Or if you saw my story on Instagram last week, I spent two days in a storm in a tent. And like, what do you do? <laughs> you know, so, so, so there begin, I begin to have this sort of rebellion against the algorithm. And then the algorithm became like, what, what do we have, the circadian clock yes, or whatever? Yes, so I, yeah, I begin to try and like battle the algorithm with this natural rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so I had to disconnect, to connect. And so, yeah, it, yeah. yeah, it's basically that simple. It's, it, it, it was really Jack and just saying, we don't know the long-term effects of social media. And we're starting to know, right? There's research now that shows that it change, shifts our brain chemistry. Yeah. Well, uh, like you think about when the pandemic happened, boom, we all jumped onto this thing, Zoom, right? Within three months of us being on Zoom, we've created a new human condition that was called fatigue, Zoom fatigue. That was three months. And so now we're doing this every freaking day, right? So now to have a Zoom is nothing, right? We can get on WebEx or get on wherever. You can work wherever. You can do whatever, wherever. I've, I've talked to you guys, Phil, like people at the gallery, we've all done Zooms. And even when they approached me about working with the gallery, it was through a Zoom, but I was so resistant. I was just like, I'll be out in the woods and I'll call you when I get service. Because I didn't want the fatigue of the Zoom. And then like hanging out with your friends, like me and my wolves, the wolves would meet on certain days and we would drink on Zoom. That felt like a party. But to do work, <laughs> and meet with your coworkers, and it's like, I don't have to be at work and I have to talk to you. That seemed like it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but to hang out with the wolves, like that is amazing. 
You yeah, know but the mean? shift in even our understanding. I remember, you know, when when we first started Zooming, I was like, what is this? It doesn't make any sense to me. I hate it. And then it just became a thing. I had to have a ring light because we turned to virtual programs. Yeah. So all of a sudden, if I was, I became an online host. And it was the strangest thing because as, fl as flamboyantly as my as I dress, I'm like, look at me, don't look at me. Yeah. And so there was this, this uh, sort of, Strange is that, and now it's strange that it's so normal. It's normal. <laughs> so. Well, in our new studio build out, William can tell you, uh, I designed a Zoom room. It's, it's quiet in the Zoom room. It's in the front, it's in the lobby, it's got the ring light. You can go set your computer up, have your studio visit or your meeting or whatever in the artist's, in our Zoom room. Like it's, yeah, it's a, a part space. of the studio yes. practice now. Yeah. And so there's a writing about that where I don't want to be zoom, zoom, zooming down an information highway. Yeah. And there's a big fuck you to it all. Mm -hmm. And so. Rejecting the algorithm. Yeah. So I just decided to, to go the opposite route of, of, of that. That's what that's about. And I find that in the works, they bear close and deep looking. That there's a way in which as I said to you before, I know that if I stand in one place in front of these works, I'm missing everything. That it insists and that it makes so real the notion that artworks aren't just these endless givers, that they make demands on us. They make demands on our perceptions. They ask us questions. I spent a lot of time looking at these two paintings and thinking about this small figure by the fire and then all of a sudden I'm in front of the fire and this kind of interaction and the ways in which become that figure but not in the same ways that a figure in a large space of the sublime, this you know old art history landscape paintings where you have the man surveying all of nature in front of him and we're supposed to understand and be in awe of, but I've never been able to quite fit into that figure, right? It's supposed to become an every man, but every man was man capital M, which did not include me in which these do something very different. I could give you guys a secret, a huge secret, right? Mm -hmm. So if, when you walk into this space, what, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a thing that's supposed to happen to you. There's a black curtain there. You, you come in from the outside, you come into the dark. You can absolutely see in the dark. You can do it. We have so much um, peripheral light, what do they call it? Um, ambient. ambient light, that we forget that that's a skill that our eyes can do. We're built to do it. So I'm wanting you to come in here and for your eyes to adjust, for that you spend enough time in here that they adjust. And then when you go back out, there's a moment where your eyes will go boom, right? And you'll have this like reawakening, right? But in this space, this space is laid out in a narrative. So if this were a graphic novel, there's a thing out front. It's the cat skins. It's gonna give you allergies. It's annoying, but that's one of the things. That's the bullshit you have to go in to get to the view. Then you see our hiker. He's traveling with a lot. He's got a lot of baggage and he's dragging some stuff, man, which may be you. Then you have to have a map. You have to set your attentions on where you want to see. There's this thing in the vast. There's a tiny fire there, and that tiny fire is absolutely that fire. That fire is absolutely that person who's trying to have this transcendent moment but it won't happen because there's things. And once the, the, the great event happens in the story, like in the Goonies, that's, those are one of my favorite stories. The thing happens, you have to have the moment. Every story has a, a moment where you have to survive the thing. There's the thing. Maybe that's a calm moment. Maybe it's not, I don't know. You have to eat. 
you have to take a life. I think that that's a skill that we've gotten away from too. We've become lazy and we go and get our food from the packaging that's behind plastic at the store and we pay for it. But if you say like, I'm not gonna take food and you catch that fish, are you willing to take that life to sustain a life? And somewhere in there, something happens to you when you can feel the energy from an animal leave to sustain your own life. Then there's a moment where you have to go towards the light. And that's when you go back out. Hopefully in that moment, there's this rebirth that you've realized something about yourself that you didn't know you were capable of, or you didn't know that was in you or that was there. That's the story. <laughs>